Well, we are working our way through a review of what many people regard as the most profound book in the entire Bible, certainly in the New Testament. The epistles of Paul, of course, are well known, but the peak of those in many people's mind is the epistle of the Romans, his definitive statement of Christian doctrine. And uh, we are in the 17th session of 24, reviewing this book, and we are entering the uh, third of the middle section. The first eight chapters are doctrinal. We went, went through those. The definitive studies of sin and its solutions. And uh, then we get to uh, the, this three-section area called, uh, which some people would call the dispensational section. There are three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, and we are in the uh, third of those three chapters tonight. We have the, the uh, first eight, as I say, are the doctrinal sessions. You look at it in three, as faith, hope, and love in three sections. Doctrinal, on sin, salvation, and sanctification, we wade through that heavy, complex, uh, essential grounding um, in the basic doctrines of what it means to be a Christian. Chapters 12 through 16 will be the practical side of things, what we do about all these things. But we're right now in a very unusual section of the book of Romans. I like to call it the 911 section of, of uh, Romans, 9, 10, and 11. It's all about Israel, but in a surprising way, it will impact every one of us. This isn't a Jewish thing. Rather, it's the very fulcrum of God's entire plan of redemption. Not just for Israel, but for you and I on the planet Earth and so on. As we will begin to realize, it involves far more than most people, many, more than many pastors fully appreciate. So we're going to talk about Israel. We, did, we went through chapter 9, which really focuses on Israel's history. And it hits head on some of these puzzling questions. If being called of God and, and foreknown and predestinated and secure by him, as, it, as chapter 8 brings us to such a climax, what about Israel? They were chosen. And you know, they were, have they been abandoned forever? No. And, we, and it deals with their past and what it means. But it's going to lead to the fact that they also have a future, and that's where we are now. Last time that we met for the last couple of sessions then, we talked about Israel in the present time, what we mean by that from the biblical period to today. We actually went through, perhaps a little tedious, but went through a whole history of the betrayal of the chosen, how again and again and again they have been not just, not just persecuted, but been betrayed by their own allies. Um, the United States promising to protect them, and when they call for that protection, the State Department couldn't find the paperwork. I mean, that sounds so phenomenal. But anyway, the, the, whole, the whole history of Israel, quite a surprise to many. But uh, at this point, I want to review one thing we mentioned. I don't, I'm not going to review all of that again, of course, but there's one thing I thought, for those that might be just joining us, uh, to a, a piece of the uh, presentation last time that I think want to, I just want to be fresh in our minds. Um, you know, Hegel is famous for saying that history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. So Santiana said the same thing another way, you know, is that he that doesn't know history is doomed to repeat it, you know, same kind of thought. And uh, that's very true. It's interesting how much we can understand of today by looking at history, and not Israel's history, but Czechoslovakia. I want to just recover this, to spend a couple of minutes reviewing what we talked about last time, but trying to put this in perspective, the rape of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, in the 30s, had, was a strategic barrier in Europe. It had 800,000 regular army that were crack troops. It, had a, it was probably the most powerful, most efficient arms industry in Europe. Many people don't realize that. It also was surrounded by the Sudeten Mountains, which protected the heartland and, and Prague, the capital. It was regarded in military terms as impregnable, powerful. The fortifications were deemed impregnable by the military experts. Furthermore, they had con uh, uh, contracts, <laughs> they had treaties with the Western powers, France, which in those days was, had a hundred divisions. It was larger than Germany, you get the picture. And they were treaty bound to protect Czechoslovakia. Britain and Russia were also guarantees of Czechoslovakia's defense. Sounds pretty formidable, doesn't it? Well, there's a strategy that was pulled off 
what you can't deal with harms, you can deal with chicanery. The propaganda solution was devised. The Sudetenland, was the Sudeten Mountains there, happened to have three million Germans. These were a minority, but there were about three million Germans in that population mix. There were about seven million others, so they, you know, they represent 30%. They were a prosperous democracy. Everybody had full civil rights. There were no real problems. But that doesn't mean you can't create a few, huh? They, they, the, the Nazis developed a um, puppet political faction, the Sudeten Free Corps, and they fabricated a terror program on the Germans in the Sudetenland uh, uh, on the so-called Sudeten Germans and created the impression that the Sudeten Germans were being oppressed by the Czechs. It was actually the Nazis pulling this off for propaganda purposes. We, the way the world got to view this is somehow these Czechs were intransigent and were an obstacle to having peace in the region. They created the impression that the Czechs were the problem. They were pre precipitating a crisis to prevent the breakup of the state. The choice between war and peace was in their hands, in the Czechs' hands. This is all nonsense, of course. This petty segment of Europe is harassing the human race. That was the kind of propaganda that's being fed. With the idea that the Western powers should force the Czechs to relinquish what they started to call the occupied territories, creating the world impression that these that the uh, Czechs were the occupiers and these three million German minorities were the rightful residents. Absolute inversion of the realities and truth. But you say it enough, especially to a managed press and an illiterate electorate, that starts becoming believed, right? Well, they manufactured a point of view. In 1937-38, the Czechs pressured by the leading Western powers to meet the Sudeten demands. The Western press laments the Czechs. They disregard peace in Europe. The injustice of not allowing the Sudetenland to be returned to Germany. It never was part of Germany. It's part of Czechoslovakia. British envoy demands that Czechs remodel their foreign relations to assure freedom from aggressive action against her neighbors. They're trying to create the impression that Czechs are the troublemakers here. September 18th, finally, big crisis. The British and French determine the Czechs must accede to Hitler's demands. They're the, they're the ones supposed to be protect, protecting them. For the maintenance of peace and the safety of Czechoslovakia's vital interests. That's, believe it or not, the words they're using. They're the ones that are getting raped here. International guarantee of new boundaries was promised. If not, they would fight Hitler alone. So they're extorting, the, 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 the France and Britain are extorting them. It's up to the Czechs now. That was the devil of Chamberlain's. They created the impression it's up to the Czechs to stop it. Hitler's out there screaming. He's the one causing the whole thing. Then the sting, as they say. Hysteria mounts. Shuttle diplomacy increases. Minutes before a deadline that Hitler set up, before September 20 deadline, Hitler agrees to Chamberlain's proposal for a peace conference, Munich. Munich is, is, has a special name in diplomatic history. Britain and France plead with Hitler for 11 hours to take the Sudetenland peacefully. Finally, at the few minutes to the end, uh, end of the, the thing, Hitler reluctantly agrees to accept that which he's set up here. Chamberlain and Delier were praised, cheered, and thanked for having traded. They come back from this conference and being cheered as the peacemakers. Chamberlain said, my friends, I believe it is peace in our time. That those will echo throughout history, that very phrase. The, the president of Czech Czechoslovakia, prime minister, had a different. We've been basically betrayed. September 30th, two days later, Czech army withdraws from the Sudetenland. German annexation was followed by more demands. Violence always, whenever you appease, that always just encourages more demands. Violence and oppression continued. By March 15th, the Nazi war machine rolled through the rest of Czechoslovakia. This impregnable fortress was handed to them by lies and deceit in the world press. Western powers did nothing. They were treaty bound to protect them. They did nothing, of course. All their assurances were proved worthless. Why am I getting into this? That's exactly what we're facing every day in the press. When we start talking about Israel, you want to do a little homework on Czechoslovakia. You want to understand that. 
This is, this is not a, a pro or anti-Semitic uh, thing. It's a question of just understanding the brutal power games being played on this planet. Israel's is also a small democracy with a powerful army and defensive terrain. Direct seizure is impractical for a lot of reasons, even though they've tried. Pressure from the West is achievable in the minds of the Arabs. We're stupid enough to buy these, the song and dance. They have a thing they call reversal of causality. They make it backwards. You get the impression that Israel is the source of terror in the Middle East. You even find it on Fox, not just CNN. They speak of the Israeli terrorists. You got it backwards, guy. I don't know of anyone that travels to a U.S. airport where they're worried about finding an Israeli bomb. They say, well, Israel's the problem of, of uh, peace in the Middle East. Iraq and Iran had an eight-year war, killed over a million of each other, and had nothing to do with Israel. There are 34 different conference, uh, conflicts going on the planet Earth as we speak today. Reversal of causality. Astonishingly effective if you've got a managed press with its own agenda and an electorate that's electorate, which is, you know, illiterate. Well, so much, I'm not going to go through all the other rest. We could obviously try to summarize what we've had. You know, I usually try to get a little uh, recap of where we've been, but uh, it's, I had to throw that in. Okay. We're going from Israel present to Israel future, and we're going to actually do this in three sessions because it's so pivotal, not just for Israel's future, for yours and mine. And most people who have studied this passage, many people who write books on prophecy have missed the point. And so I'm going to get into a lot of con con uh, you know, controversial material. So, so uh, we've had the... I re reject it. Let's go. Israel's future. Isaiah 65, first eight verses, will sort of set us up. For, uh, for Romans 11. So let's just take a quick look at Isaiah 65. God says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me into a nation that was not called by my name. Notice the thing here. People that, you know, that he uh, asked for me could, couldn't find him. And those that weren't looking for him did. Who's he talking about here? Who do you think he's talking about here? The Jews and the Gentiles. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a, day, which in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoked me to anger continually to my face. That sacrificed in gardens and burned incense upon altars of brick. Which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments. Which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me. For I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my noise, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, as written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense, into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Whew, boy. Yeah, it's going to get rough. See, even though believing, unbelieving, Israel will be judged. Right? There will always be a remnant. So among them are all these that are rebellious and re and. and and uh, eat non-kosher foods, to say the least. Uh, there will always be a remnant of core that are faithful to him and that uh, he will call his own. So that sets the stage for Romans chapter 11, which is full of surprises. Let's just jump in. Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? By the way, that's the presumption of virtually all the de Christian denominational churches. Ask them, pastors will tell you that, well, you know, the, the promises on Israel, she forfeited that because she rejected her Messiah. They now are the churches. That works for anybody except the ones that read those promises that God made all through the Old Testament. And the New, by the way. They say, Paul say, raising this issue. Hath God cast away his people? Huh? Make an oito. God forbid. Be it not so is a better translation, perhaps. Paul speaking, for I also am an Israelite, 
and of the seed of Abraham, and of the tribe of Benjamin. A very proud place to be. King Saul was also from the tribe of Benjamin. His name was Saul too, until he changed it to Paul. See, in Greek, the question is asked in the, in the negative, with a negative point. Did, God did not reject his people, did he? In other words, in the Greek, the grammar is structured so that it's a, a rhetorical question, not really asking for an answer. And this classic ejaculation of Paul's, a negative ejaculation, may konoito, which one way to translate is by no means, may it not be so, but in the, intense, in the intensity of it. Now, Paul's going to give us several proofs here. His first proof is himself. He quotes this in more detail in his Philippian letter, where it says, He circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and is touching the law of Pharisee. This is a, a concatenation of his Jewish pride. He's as Jewish as they get. He's also one of the most educated Greeks alive in that day, but that's a whole other issue. If God could save Paul, he certainly can save the other Jews, is the point that's underlying this, and that's developed in Acts 9 and 1 Timothy, 2 and so, or 1 Timothy 1 and so forth. So he continues here. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. And he's now, he's going to quote here from 1 Samuel and, and from Psalm 94. By the way, he says, whom he foreknew. The word prognosko is to have knowledge beforehand, to have, and it's not just knowledge intellectually, it's to have a meaningful relationship, is what it implies. And I think, it, uh, I forget the scholar, maybe I have it in my notes here. Yeah, Stilfer. Stilfer points out in, in, uh, from, from, uh, that there's only one nation on the planet Earth that can, that, of which that can be said, where the nation has a re relationship with God. Because you know, God foreknew only one nation. Now, that can be misunderstood. He obviously can fore, he foreknows everything, but I'm in, in the tense in relationship here. And so, uh, uh, he chose his covenant people from eternity past and entered into a relationship with them that can never be destroyed. That's a missing point. To many, many theologians miss that. And, and Amos 3, 2 brings in some of this. That's where Stifler comes from this. You, you only have I known of all the families of the earth... That's God speaking. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. See, your family. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth can be searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Now, that's obviously an inversion because that's not true. It's always dangerous to, to argue from contrary fact presumption, but you get what he's, the point he's making. You know, like he says that in other places, if the sun can stand still, then I'll give up Israel. You know, he, it's a way, like never, 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 see? See, the second proof that God has not rejected his people was taken from Israel's history during Elijah's ministry. The prophet was deeply depressed. And that's, what, that's, when, he's, that's when Paul is quoting from Elias. He's quite, quite, Jeremiah talks about it. Thus said the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured, the fountains of the earth can be searched out, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. God hath not cast away his people. He goes on, he says... Uh, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. That's what, I remember, Elijah was convinced he was the last one. He's running from Jezebel, and he's ready to kill himself. I mean, he's just, it's over. And uh, so, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and so forth. This is Elijah bawling like a baby. And he, Paul is quoting here from 1 Kings 19, for those of you that are going to follow up on this. Consider himself, he's the only, Elijah's the only one left. You ever felt that way? There are times, you know, there are times you feel, well, what was the answer God gave unto him, Paul asks? Paul, he's quoting Paul, uh, uh, God here, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That, you know, Elijah, there's, God has his that no one knows, even knows about. He's not limited to one fearful, depressed prophet. You reserve a godly remnant of over seven. There's all, one of the things you study throughout the Bible, there's always a remnant. Never many. The remnant's small, but that's God's bunch. And the bunch that he has is always a work of God, not a work of the remnant. So it continues, verse 5. We're getting down to verse 5. Make good progress then. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That is even true today. Even in Hollywood. 
Even in Washington. Hard to believe, I know, but okay. There's always going to be a remnant. And Paul was only one of many in the generation elected to faith from the people of Israel. In every generation of the church, a remnant chosen by grace has been called from among the Jews. It started, we started with the Jewish Bible, we had Jewish leadership, and we worship a Jewish king. Verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Boy, we need to understand that. See, grace plus works makes it debt, doesn't it? No, grace means no work. It's, no, there's no, it's, it's, all, it's one direction. But if it be of works, then is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. <laughs> yeah, this choice is totally by God's grace. That's also Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You've all memorized it. I'll go on. He emphasized that the antithesis between grace and works, both here, we went through all that in Romans 4, we re rehashed it in Romans 9, so I don't have to beat it here, I don't think. We're down to verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Think about what that means. Those in Israel that are God's own, were not those that were going after what they were seeking. They were elected by God to have it revealed to them. Think about what that means for every one of us. The rest were blinded. Do you have people that can't see it? Doesn't mean you shouldn't witness to them. Don't misunderstand me. But election has a big t t thing to do with it. Israel sought God, but failed to find him. Why? Why? Because they're trying to find him through their own works. That's doomed to failure. You can't strive to find God. He's got to reveal himself to you. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Gentiles who are not looking for him found him through faith. There's an irony here. I want you to notice that. See, the Israelis that were lost were sincere but wrong. That's what Romans 10 was all about. Romans 10, first four verses. We went through all that in 10. This is just sort of recap. The Jews jealously sought to be accepted by God on what basis? On the basis of their works. Keeping the law, doing this, doing that right. You know, attended Sunday school faithfully for 20 years. You know, I handled the singing of the choir. Oh, great. That's all works. It can be beneficial if it's led by the Spirit. Don't misunderstand me. They, were, they were sought to be accepted by... God on the base of works and the righteousness of the law. No, the righteousness of the law is a yardstick you can never meet. Again, that's all Romans 10 again. But they were not accepted by God. Only the elect were accepted because of God's sovereign choice by grace. That's Paul's point. This is a Pharisee commenting on Pharisaicalism. No better expert. And the others were hardened. And that's what Romans 11 is going to peek at in some surprising ways for every one of us. Let's get back to Romans 8, 11, verse 8. Parenthetic. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. You've got to be kidding. Yes, God has blinded them. Jesus declared that, and we're going to get to that point. What does it mean to be hardened? It's seen from Paul's explanatory and supporting quotations. What do we mean by being hardened? It's, we're going to see it. Paul's got a quote from Deuteronomy 29 and Isaiah 29. And it indicates that when we speak hardening, what it involves, what the words really involve is spiritual drowsiness. Spiritual drowsiness. And the word there is kanonuxis in the Greek. A pricking or piercing is one meaning of it. Severe sorrow or extreme grief. Insensibility or torpor of mind such as numbness or resulting from a sting, blindness, or deafness. So it's a numbness is perhaps more vivid in our, in our vernacular. Romans verses 9 to, uh, 11, 9 to 10. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. 
That's the second quotation Paul is using to support this, taken from Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is one of the most remarkable psalms in the book of Psalms. It talks about him in Gethsemane. It talks about his calling down on his enemies, but it also describes those anxious, dark years in Nazareth, the 30 years where he and his mother were under the cloud of illegitimacy, and his own brothers did not believe in him. And all that is recounted, surprisingly, in Psalm 69. But here it predicts those things which should have been the source of nourishment and a blessing to Israel, but became the occasion of the rejection of God. A snare and a trap and a stumbling block, to use David's terms, here quoted by Paul. The table, of course, is just a, 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 a synecdoche for the broader thing. You, you use a, she sets a fine table, meaning not the table, meaning her whole, her, her, her whole appointments, right? Boy, you got some neat wheels there, guy. We don't mean his wheels, we mean his whole car. You know, that's a synecdoche. If the, the specific for the general or the general for the specific. You follow me? It's, a, it's an idiomatic term. Well, table here means the, all the blessings from the hand of God, which should have led them to Christ. And, uh, but they, and they, a recompense to them, that is God's judgment on them. Recompense, that which you got in return. They bow down their back, it says. Why? Because they re refused to receive God's truth. They're searching for God, and yet they refused the truth when, it was con when he, they were confronted with it. How tragic. Their backs will be bent under the weight of guilt and punishment is the idiomatic idea here. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. There again, don't, you know, he's trying to keep you from making the wrong conclusions with that favorite ejaculation of his, a negative ejaculation, God forget, forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. For several reasons. One is to provoke them to je jealousy. So yes, they've stumbled. They're not going to fall. God's going to take his own and bring them up. They're not, they're not out of the game here. And again, you know, the, the Greek uh, word is always a negative. May it, it never be. They did not stumble to fall permanently is the thought. The NIV tries to twist it, put it beyond recovery, in other words. By the tense of the verb fell, and the contrast with the verb translated stumble, it implies uh, imply the idea of falling beyond recovery. You've got to be careful with that. Israel experienced not a permanent fall, but a stumbling it preserved for at least two divine purposes. One is to offer salvation to the Gentiles, and that's what Ephesians 2 is all about. And then the uh, second reason is to provoke them to jealousy, to make Israel envious to the provoking them to jealousy. That's the Deuteronomy 32 illusion. But let's get back. Let's take a look at the Ephesians 2 illusion here. Paul writes to Ephesians, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. That's the Ephesians expression there. In another place in Ephesians, you get a similar thought here where he's talking about that you are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined into his wife. The two shall be one flesh. Drawing an analogy there in the marriage with Christ and his assembly. And that thing we're going to encounter in more depth when we attack the issue of what is this strange term, the bride of Christ? What's all that about? How is it different than the body of Christ? We'll talk about that. And 1 Corinthians 6 will deal with that. Let's get down to verse 12 in Romans 11. Now if the fall of them, the Israels, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, got it so far? How much more their fullness? See, in other words, if we're blessed by their stumbling, how much more will we be blessed when they're restored? That's, his, that's the flavor he's, he's painting here. The word diminishing here is a numerical word, implying that not all are rejected. Some were. It's a, just another hint that he's talking about a you know, subset. See, the grammar requires that they will have more fullness and so on. They will be coming into their fullness that's what we're going to be dealing with here. Yes, they've stumbled, but they've got a surprise coming, a big one. 
It's not saying if, we use the word if, but it's when in the, in the, in the Greek grammar. Look here down to verse 13, for I speak unto you Gentiles. See, the Roman church, by the way, he wasn't writing to the church at Rome. He was talking to church, Christians that it were in Rome, many house churches, but most of them were Gentiles. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. And so, I want you to notice something, to just follow this, Paul's passion was for his countrymen, for the Jews, but he knew, he understood, he reluctantly agreed that God called him to go to the Gentiles. Peter and Paul had that all understanding. Peter went to the Jews, Paul went to the Gentiles. Paul wished it was the other way around, because he loved the Jews, but he knew that he, that, that he, he was the apostle of the Gentiles. From time to time, he tried to deal with it. And he would always go to the Jews first when he visited town. And when they threw rocks at him, then he'd find the okay. You know. uh, in Jerusalem, he tried to speak to them. And the Romans had to get him out of there to save his life. So it, that was his, that's the story of his life. So I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I'm apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. He's focusing on that. He's a special apostle of the Gentiles. That's emphasized in Acts 9. And of course, in the Galatians letters, and if he, it comes up several times. Twice in his ministry, he had turned away from unbelieving Jews to the Gentiles, very specifically. Acts 13 and 18, that's a key thought. And he would do it again so once more in Rome, he'll do the same thing again. But he goes on, If by any means I, might, I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, and might save some of them. See, he was hoping that even though he's not, a, he's a minister of the Gentiles, he was hoping that by their growth and, 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 and uh, fulfillment of their spiritual conditions, that would get the Jews envious and at least get some of them to wake up and get, get it right. So he's called to the Gentiles about his hearts with his countrymen. Verse 15, by, And if by the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Widely misunderstood verse, by the way, because he's using it idiomatically, but we're going to... See, it's, it's a... It, there's four conditions in the Greek for the if clause, if clause. This is the first condition, meaning it is. It's such a, and it is. We might use the term since rather than if here. Verse 15 and verse 12 are in a climactic relationship I'll show you in a minute here. Back in verse 12, it said, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, right? Um, for if the casting away of them, and, and see, the two verses, 12 and 15, are uh, uh, closing on this. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Strange phrase. Let's look at this carefully. In verse 12, we have transgression, riches, and diminishing. 15, you have casting away, reconciliation, life from the dead. See, some equate the life from the dead to Israel's acceptance of Christ in a spiritual sense. That's not really what's in view here. And many uh, if they relate to the first, like the first resurrection, Revelation 20. Not a problem with that, but that's not really what it's saying here. Uh, they, they try to make it the resurrection of life is what they're trying to make the life from the uh, resurrection passage. That's really not what it's referring to. It's really referring to, see, the first resurrection is a category I want to clear up something else as we go here. For we speak of first and second resurrection. First resurrection is not an event. It's a category of several events. It includes Christ's resurrection. He was the first fruits, Matthew 27. The dead saints at the rapture. Those who are alive and remain will caught up together with them. But those that are dead in Christ rise first, right? Those are the first resurrection. The martyred great tribulation saints raised at Christ's return. The second coming. Those are all members of that category, the first resurrection. As incidentally, so are the two witnesses in, Re in Revelation 11. The believing Old Testament saints are part of the first resurrection, in contrast to the second resurrection, which is a different category. That's going to include all the wicked dead to be judged at the great white throne judgment. I'll explain those in a minute here. The two events are... are they're, they're not two events chronologically. They're separated in time, but they're categories because there's multiple events in each. They're not simultaneous elements, in, uh, uh, and they're, they're elements separated in time. They don't happen at the same instant. There are some verses that mention both, but that doesn't imply they happen together. Many people get confused by that. Let's talk a little bit about judgments to get this sorted out because we're going to get into a lot of stuff here. 
There is a judgment seat called the Bema Seat of Christ. It's called that for some misunderstandings, but that's okay. It's gonna, the name will stick, and if you don't pick up, it's sort of, well, there are a number of these terms that if you don't use the, if you, if you try to be correct, you'll get people confused. <laughs> so, because everybody's heard about the Bema Seat. The way it's usually presented is that the Bema Seat, the Bema Seat was a seat where the judges gave the prizes to the athletes. And so this is a, what they're trying to say is this is a place where everybody gets, no one goes, no, no one gets judged to hell. They all get different measures of good things. Well, that sounds good. That's what it probably is. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a gift of rewards, but the word Bema Seat, that's not, that's not an accurate translation of it. And I'll show you that in a minute. We'll get into that a little bit. But anyway, at the Bema Seat, the people who are judged there are Christians. They're Christians. Some have done really well, some haven't done so well. Some get great stuff, some don't get much. And, I, and, and, and there's, we're going to get into that a little bit before it's all over. And there's, all kind, there's kingdom parables about this, that's the, the, the ten talents, the ten virgins, those that were uninvited to the wedding feast. There are a number of things that give us illumination as to the results of this, and they, they will be surprising to many. But we're not talking about anyone being cast into hell. These are all before Christ getting rewarded for their faithfulness. It's also the place where the bride is called out of the body for the, to, be the, to participate in the marriage of the, with the Lamb. The bride of the Messiah. Strange term, really, because the Old Testament always talked about the adulterous wife of Yahweh. They're not the same. The, the one is the church, as we think of it. The other is Israel. Except in both cases, it's a subset. It's a subset. And we'll talk more about that in the next session. Then we have another judgment called the sheep and goat judgment. And you read about this in Matthew 25. But the more you study it, the more confusing it'll be because there are three different groups there. Some people call it the judgment of the nations. That's because they think the word there, ethos, means nations. It actually means different peoples. It's the term used for Gentiles. But it really means different peoples. They're not judged as groups or judged as individuals, but they're from different groups. Italians, whatever, you know, Irish, you name it, okay. But they're judged by Christ. There's two groups, sheep and goats. And what determines whether you're sheep or goat? How you treat a third group called his brethren. That's the first thing you've got to understand. There's really three groups involved. How did you treat my brethren? Israel. This occurs right after the tribulation. There'll be a time of trouble on the planet Earth, the likes of which have never been ha happened before, where being a Christian will cause you death. Being a Jew, you'll be a subject of specific persecution. But in that world, there'll be some at risk of their own life that'll protect the Jews. There'll be the Eric Schindler types. The Corey Ten Boom types, who at their own risk will... And at the end of that, Christ says, how did you treat my people? When, when, did we, did you, when you did it to them, you did it to me. And many of the people that won, that did well, are surprised. Those that didn't do well are also surprised. But here's the real shock. They go on the basis of their works to hell or not. You don't go, well, yes, yes. Read it, check it out. Mortals are, these are mortal people. These are not supernaturally resurrected. These are mortals at the end of the tribulation. He comes back. They're mortal people there. They're judged on the basis of works. And the judgment there isn't something intermediate. It is, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. On the basis of works. Boy, that shatters a lot of theology. But there's some reasons for that. But the other one that gets confused, the third one that gets confused, that's the great white throne, as it's called, from Revelation 20. It's at the end of the millennium, and that's where it's, that's where all the bad guys get theirs. All, anybody that's been overlooked by then, comes up before the great white throne, is judged by their works, and there it's disastrous. And uh, then at that ends the millennium that puts us into a new heavens, not just a new earth, a new heavens and a new earth and a new merging of the wife and the bride in the New Jerusalem. The order of events. Most of you know that by now I've been wearied with the Daniel 9 
summary, where we have the interval in the 70th week of Daniel. Prior to that 70th week, there's the harpazo, the rapture, according to 1 Thessalonians uh, for, or, or, yeah, excuse me, Second Thessalonians 2, we know it comes before the Antichrist. The week's defined by treaty of the Antichrist. You can't, to, to, to be powerful to formulate a treaty, he has to have been revealed. He isn't really revealed until after the Harpazzo. Okay. Now, there's an interval there. We don't know how much. It could be a, an hour. It could be 30 years. We don't know. There is an interval, though, between. It's not necessarily co, coterminous with 70-week Daniel. Well, up in heaven, then, we have the Bema seat. That's the first thing that occurs. We have this judgment of Christians. Who did well and who didn't do so well, but they're all, they're all saved. Those are all justified. Their passports say you can enter. Great. But there's a lot more coming for those that have been faithful. In fact, one of the big things is the marriage of the Lamb. Well, we're all going to marry? No, 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 no. Well, who's the bride? Well, we get to that. Now, meanwhile, down on the earth, this guy has risen to power. He's made a treaty for, with Israel. And... Uh, Right in the middle of that period that he promised, he violates that, sets himself up to be worshipped as what's called the abomination of desolation. And that's right in the middle of the seven-year period. And that's the most documented period of time in the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, do your own arithmetic, it's named all those different ways. The last half, the tribulation, the great tribulation is not seven years, it's three and a half. People tend to use the term tribulation to mean the whole 70th week of Daniel. But if you're going to be a skillful student in the Bible, be precise. It's the 70th week of Daniel. If you're talking about the seven years, call it the 70th week of Daniel. Then you'll be, you can't argue with that. Don't call it tribulation, that's confusing. The, tri the great tribulation was labeled by Jesus Christ himself, referring to the second, last half. And he's quoting... Daniel 12, he's quoting Michael. We'll look at that before it's all over. Anyway, at the end of that 70th week, the climax is this world war which ends in Armageddon. It's become an idiom in our language. But no, it's a real place, a real war, a real time. And that's when the Lord comes back in power, called the second coming. Yes, he comes back twice, once to gather his church and once on behalf of Israel. And that leads to the establishment of his kingdom. For how long? How long will he reign? Forever. Good for you. Not a thousand years. His kingdom is a thousand years because then something else happens. Very good. Okay. One of the first things he does is the sheep and goat judgment. Rounds up those that were friendly to his people. And, and makes, they're the sheep. They get the good stuff. The other guys, boy, tough stuff. And that's where we have the marriage supper, the feast that celebrates the wedding. That confused me a long time until, in sorting, Nan, my wife has really gone through over 50 experts through the centuries. And sorting that out, that doesn't mean we're correct, but we come to the, the inference that the marriage of the Lamb is very intimate. The marriage supper is still restricted, but that's to celebrate the marriage. And there's models that suggest all that. We, really, we believe the marriage occurs in heaven, but the marriage supper will be in the kingdom on the earth. We'll come to that in a little bit. Right after that, there's a strange period of time, another 30 days and then another 45 days, that mystifies everybody. Everybody has guesses, no one knows. Exactly, blessed is he that makes it all the way to the 1335. And I think, I suspect, those have something to do with those judgments. At the end of the thousand years, we have the big one, the great white throne. And uh, when that happens, we have the, then the new heavens and new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes down into our reality. Interesting. Now what happens after the harpazo, the rapture? In heaven, judgment seat of Christ, marriage of the Lamb. On the earth, we have the emergence of the world leader, more than one, there's a duet, remember? The great tribulation takes place, the campaign of Armageddon, second coming of Christ, and that's when the Davidic kingdom is established. It shocked me to really, like most students of scholar, a scholar of, of Bible uh, uh, scholarship. The Davidic kingdom, you ought to read that in the Old Testament. Well, that's Israel. That's the kingdom of David. Never connect the dots to realize, no, that's the Old Testament label for what we would call the millennium. It's a Davidic kingdom. And it's part of the, on the unconditional covenants. That's what's so shocking. You see, the church has sort of neglected the Old Testament. It's got this idea that they somehow have replaced Israel, so they don't pay attention to what Israel's going to get. If they did, they'd realize that something's not correct here. The Lord's return, Harpazo, or death in Christ, 
or with him, dwelling with him in the kingdom. And what about this issue of paradise? There's issues there. You're going to be with me in paradise. And that's where we get our new resurrection body. From 1 John 3, 2, we understand that whatever it is, is going to be just like Christ. We, Beloved, if not yet appear, what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Not a representation. We shall see him as he really is. Wow. The Oketerian term appears only twice in the scripture. Once in the terms of what the angels that did evil disrobed from. And the other place it's used is the body that we aspire to in our resurrection body. Same word. It's a technical term. Oketerian. But the Bema Seat, I want to talk about a little bit about this. Second Chronicle, uh, Corinthians 5.10, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us that are Christians. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to worry about it. You've got other things to worry about. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, you still have a lot to be concerned over. And 1 Corinthians 3 tells you the ground rules. Every one of us will have our works tested by fire. And they're in two categories. What is that? Gold, silver, precious stones. And if it doesn't get consumed, you get, you get rewarded. If it doesn't, you're still saved, but you'll arrive as a refugee, so to speak. Okay? The Bema Seat. It's a step, pace, or space with a foot covers, a foot breath, technically. It's a raised place mounted by steps, a platform, tribune. The official seat of a judge of the judgment seat of Christ. Herod built a structure resembling the throne in Caesarea, from which he viewed the games and made speeches. That's where people get the idea that this is just a, this isn't a real judgment. Wrong. Wrong. And this, of course, is where the rewards are given out. Colossians 3 deals with that and many other passages. Pilate judged Christ in Matthew 27 on a bema seat. People overlook that. Herod, when he was smitten by worms there in Acts 12, he was on a bema seat. Galileo was sentencing Paul. He chose not to sentence him, but he was doing it from a bema seat. Festus, trial, sentencing, Acts 25, on a bema seat. This notion that's prevalent among many uh, pastors is that the bema means, well, it's just a, it's not a judgment. It's just where you get, you're going to give out gifts. No, uh-uh. It is a judgment seat. It's correct that no one's getting punished by it, except in the sense they will not get their inheritances. Judgment seat of Christ, Romans 14, elsewhere. And we get rewards for faithful. You know, some are going to be entrusted with special privileges. Some are not. Some are going to reign with Christ. 2 Timothy 2, Revelation 3. Some will not. You're Christians. You won't reign with them. Unless, of course, you've suffered with him. Unless, of course, there's some the conditions. Some rich, some poor. Some heavenly treasures of their own. Some not. There are going to be 12 areas of judgment. How we treat other believers. I've got to start being nice to pet Nan here then, huh? Yeah, yeah. How we exercise our authority over others. Ooh, boy. How we employ our God given abilities. You're a steward, you're going to be held accountable. Well, I'm saved. Yeah, of course. The only people I'm talking about are saved. The ones that aren't saved have got other problems. How we use our money. That's going to be an issue before the judgment seat of Christ? Boy, I've got to re-examine some of my practices. I'm pretty sloppy on some things. I'm going to be held accountable to Him. How we spend our time. That's probably the most biggest indictment of all. Do you mean I'm going to be held accountable for trivia? Those hours that I've wasted on nonsense? I'm accountable for. Oh boy. A lot of golfers are feeling very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> How much we suffer for Jesus. Now that's a big one. There are a lot of verses which underscore this. Suffering for Christ. Not being obnoxious to others. That's not considered a blessing. But those that suffer for Christ... How we run that particular race which God has chosen for us. Boy, how many of us are climbing a ladder and get to the top at the end of our life and realize it was leaning on the wrong wall? Boy, does that describe a lot of careers. That's true of me. I was, a, I was an enthusiastic Christian since I was a teenager. Bible studies, pre reveille prayer meetings when I was in the service. I mean, all of that. But then I got out of the, I was busy creating... 
buying and selling high technology companies. I served on 12 public boards. I was doing my thing. Climbing the wrong ladder. Praise God. I'm glad he kicked it out from under me. I'm glad he did. He really, I'm glad he did. I really am glad, and he did. And uh, we're going to run that particular race which God has chosen for us. How effectively we can control the old nature. You know, it's interesting. I don't lose my temper with people, but I sure do against inanimate objects. Stuck drawers, tools that don't fit quite right, whatever. I'm, I confess to you, I, there are signs, there, there, there are times in my life that I am astonishingly immature. Fortunately, it's still against inanimate objects, but it, it, I'm still guilty. Am I controlling my old nature? How many souls we win, witness to and win to Christ? How we react to temptation? How much the doctrine of the rapture means? You know, that's a, that's a factor. Second Timothy 4. The blessed hope is exactly that, by the way. Well, the blessed hope is general to many. No, it's a very specific thing. The love is appearing. How faithful we are to the word of God and the flock of God. That's the faithfulness that counts. Boy, this changes your perspective. If you just paste these on your bathroom mirror. Second Peter 1. Peter talking now. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, ooh, and patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. If these things be in you, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Diligence, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, Brotherly kindness and agape. But he that lacketh these things, okay, let's, this is the dark side. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Whoops, wait a minute. What's Peter saying? I just read Romans 8. I thought we were eternally secure. You are. Don't misunderstand me. You are. And yet, what's he talking about here? You need to make your calling and election sure. What does that mean? I thought we could just coast. I mean, you know, I accepted Christ. I really have. No doubt about that. Can I just, I got it now. I got it going now. No, well, if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at Paul. Did Paul write Romans 8? Did Paul have any doubt about his eternal security? Remember Romans 8? I should have really worked it in the, in the notes right about here just to remind you, but I don't think I should have to, right? I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, angels or principalities nor powers or, you know, the whole thing, principalities and so forth. Neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Or how he says, Timothy, I know in whom I believe that he is, able, he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Did Paul understand his eternal security? Okay. Notice what he writes in his first letter to Corinth. Chapter 9, verse 27. Paul speaking. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway? You've got to be kidding. You know who's speaking here? Paranoid Paul. Paranoid Paul. That I myself should... Here's a, he, was a, he was a type A. Right? I have a feeling, you know, he didn't get ulcers. He was a carrier. You know, he gave <laughs> um, I myself should be a castaway. What on earth is Paul so afraid of? All through his letters, he writes like an athlete. I'm pressing to the mark. I'm, I'm, I'm running the race to win. Running what race? I thought you were saved. I'm saved. That's not his point. That's what Christ did for him. What he's trying to do is not forfeit his inheritance. 
Do you think there's something that he's concerned about we might pay attention to? How many of you have been taught? In your, give me a show of hands. How many of you have been taught about inheritance or losing your rewards? Not many people can have their hands up. You don't hear that very often, do you? I can't. If you're Christians, if you're not Christians, we should talk afterwards. Seriously. Don't leave here unless you know you are. If you suspect you are, it's not good enough. Come up and see me before it's over. But I'm going to assume all of you accepted Christ. There's something we should be aware of. My wife and I are so concerned about this, we're writing a book on this very subject. We divide it 50-50. She does all the work, I take all the credit. <laughs> no, she really is. I, I would just be flippant. She really poured years into this. And, and uh, it's re the Lord has just raised fog in our lives. We've discovered things that, uh, to us at least, were new and exciting, and, but yet gripping. Because we're shocked at how we, 50, 60 years Christians, and attending many churches, have never been taught. And it's there, clear, in the scripture. The, no one has collected, connected the dots. And don't, don't listen to us. Connect your own dots, but know where to look. The body of Christ. How many of you are in the body of Christ? Praise God. I won't ask you the other question because you don't know. One body, many members. You have all the verses. It's complete at the harpazo. Not all that are saved are in the body of Christ. There are Old Testament saints, there's others, so let's not get into all that here. But both the, the dead and alive in the Harbatso are raised in unity. Ephesians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, etc. Now we get to another subject that everybody talks about, but here we get a little fuzzy. Okay, what's the bride of Christ? Is that the same thing? I don't think so. You see. A bride is usually a selection. Eve was a selection out of the body of Adam. That should tell us something, huh? It's the most intimate subset of the body. So within the body of Christ, there is a, I don't want to use the word remnant, but I could use it. Eve was taken outside of Adam, Genesis 2. Eliezer, uh, who is the type of the Holy Spirit, commissioned by Abraham to get a bride for Isaac. And he instructs him, be very careful, no one around here, you go to our own people. So he goes there, by the way, with ten camels. That's a clue for another discussion. When he gets there, he selects the bride for Isaac out of their own people. Right? First point. Then you start studying brides in the Bible. Ruth, wash, anoint thee, put on thy raiment. The bride always is wearing her own raiment. But wait a minute. Our righteousness is given to us by Christ. Yes, but her righteousness is her righteousness. Something else going on here. She is to wash. Ephesians 5 talks about that, washing by the word. 1 John 1, 9. The Christian's bar of soap is there described. Then she is to anoint herself. Remember the... Extra oil, five virgins. Only five made it, ten didn't. I mean, ten went, but only five made it to the wedding set. Ooh, that's interesting. They were all saved, but they weren't all selected. The Holy Spirit's given them response to obedience. Rebecca, when she gets to, uh, to Isaac, when she first sees him afar off, she puts her own veil on. She, the bride is always putting on her raiment. When you get to Revelation 19, the bride of Christ is arraigning herself in her arraignment. That should bother you. Rate herself in righteous acts, Revelation 19. We are to keep our own garments. We're instructed all through the scripture. We don't pay attention to that because we are looking at it in a different sense. Our righteousness is Christ. Indeed it is. Don't misunderstand me. And yet our own arraignment is being accumulated. It may not qualify. Not for salvation. We're saved. By the way, wedding garments are expensive. Revelation 3 talks about that. Romans 12 is going to talk about it. We'll bring that up there. But as far as the wedding supper, only the selected may attend. Not only, maybe not, not only are maybe not the bride, you may not even be attending the wedding feast. Depends. Depends on what? The Bema seat. How'd you make out? What kind? Do you get an e-coupon? E-coupon? What kind do you get? Only Disneyland people catch that one. Okay. The old Disneyland people. 
Life from the dead is a misunderstood term. The teaching that there will be one general resurrection of all humanity at one time fails to take all these distinct... That, that idea is prominent, presumed, but wrong. Most, almost every idea in the world and among Christians about death and heaven, and especially about heaven, is wrong, not biblical. Because we've never really gotten into it, unfortunately. Here, however, the life of the dead appears to be used in a national sense, incident. And that's pretty obvious from the grammar. Let's take a look at what's really going on there in Ezekiel 37. This is Ezekiel again. He said unto me, Son of man, these bones, speaking of the famous dry bones vision that we all know about in Ezekiel 37, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. He's not speaking of resurrection. He's speaking nationally. This, by the way, predicts the, the, uh, the heresy of the dominionist and kingdom now theologians, by the way, this whole Ezekiel thing. They are in the land. Then, after they're in the land, God gives them the Spirit. And uh, all these arguments about this should have ended on May 14th or 48th, because it's in the land. There they are. Take a look. And what's next on their schedule? A terrifying war. That's what Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to the end details for you. But get, let's take a look at this Daniel 12 thing. That's what Jesus quotes about all of this. He's, this is, uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, writes, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. See, the two named angels that we know about, I'll skip Lucifer, obviously. Gabriel and Michael have job descriptions. Gabriel is always on a job of announcing something about the Messiah. Michael is a warrior prince. He is always engaged in war on behalf of Israel. They're very specific guys, apparently. And there shall be a time of trouble such was never, that never was since there was a nation even at that same time. That's quite a statement. That means it's going to be worse than the Holocaust in Germany by a factor of more than two to one. The Holocaust in, by the Nazis took one Jew and three on the planet Earth. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9 seems to indicate that two out of three will fall in the next one. And Jesus is quoting this when he labels that period of time the Great Tribulation. A time of trouble such as never since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And there are several books, by the way. Time of trouble such as never was. And he continues, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Not at the same time necessarily. That's another issue. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So Daniel describes, by the way, a lot more than took place at 70 AD, with all due apologies to those preterists that are on the radio saying ridiculous things. These events are just before the resurrection, the second coming, the restoration of Israel, and all of that. The restoration includes the resurrection of those that Mr. Harpazzo, by the way, when Israel is regathered, there's going to be another resurrection. That'll include those that were not there in the, in the first one. We're down to verse 16, Romans 11. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. First of two illustrations. This was from Numbers 15. You know, they had, when they entered Canaan, their first wheat harvest, they instructed Israel to take a cake from the, from the ground and present it as an offering. If the first part was holy, then the whole... Uh, 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 Harvest was considered holy, is the idea, see? The cake made from the first ground was sanctified, made, made the whole harvest holy, is the idea. So if some of the branches be broken off, thou being a wild olive tree grafted in, that's you Gentiles, and with them the par partakest of the root and the fastness of the olive tree. In other words, some of the branches were broken off, but we were grafted in in their place, right? But we're supported by the olive tree, not the other way around, is this point that he's going to make. The second illustration of that a tree, the root is holy, so are the branches. The branches, of course, are the Israelites, and the wild olive tree, of course, are the Gentiles. And they're, and they're made partakers of the same substance. Both illustrations, both the wheat, the harvest, and the tree are the same idea. What is considered first contributes its character to what follows after it. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, if the root bears you. We don't support Abraham, Abraham supports us, is the point he's making. Don't be arrogant, is the way NASB puts this. And the root he's talking about here is, of course, Abrahamic root. 
The root of the tree is the source of life and nourishment to all the house. Abraham is the father of all who believe in Romans 4. He went through all that back then. So Gentile believers are linked to the Abraham in one sense. They owe their salvation to him, not vice versa. We owe our salvation to him. That's the point he's making. He made that all. This is repetitive from before. So boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, perish not the root, root thee. This passage does not teach that national promises of Israel are now being fulfilled by the church. It's just the opposite. Paul said Israel's fall is temporary, not permanent. All believing Gentiles share in the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant as Abraham's spiritual children. They do not permanently replace Israel as the heirs of God's promises. And that's all through the scripture. Remember by the, woman at the, the woman at the well in Samaria, John 4. She, Samaritan, she's asking, where is salvation? And before he, when he answers some other question, he says, salvation is of whom? The Jews, indeed. And just in that context. We're getting down to the wire here. Romans eleven nineteen. 19. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So there's no room for arrogance here. And this is, again, first-class condition, assumed to be true. Since, in other words, since God spared not, not if that he might not. No, it's, a, it's the first condition of the four conditions. And thee, there are... Gentiles. And that's a message to America, isn't it? That's a message to America. You know, this section explains the righteousness of God's sovereign choice, which is the real point. He got into all this. Israel's fall, its loss, its rejection in verses 11, 12, 15. The branch is broken off because of unbelief. If God is righteous in temporarily putting aside Israel as a whole for unbelief, he certainly could put aside the Gentiles for boasting and hardiness. This is, a call, this is a call to be cautious. Verse 22, Behold, behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. He, here, here he summarizes this whole discussion of God's sovereign cho choice in temporarily putting Israel aside corporately and proclaim righteousness by faith to all mankind. We have this term goodness, krestotis, moral goodness, integrity, kindness, it's also used of God, by the way, in Romans 2 and Ephesians and elsewhere. The word severity, really, apotomia, sternness, it's the only place it appears is here in the New Testament. However, the adverb form of this, meaning harsh or, or sharply, in 2 Corinthians Titus. Why should God have more patience with us than he did with faithless Judaism? God's continuing goodness to the Gentiles depends on their continuing in his kindness. That's sobering to consider. If Gentiles do not continue in God's kindness, they also, and he's speaking of them collectively here, not individually, and this does not suggest that a Christian can lose his salvation. It refers to Gentiles collectively, suggested by the singular thou from the gospel, such as the nation Israel had done. And if they, if they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them, and Israel can be grafted in. They here is Israel. And as Paul wrote earlier, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, the last verse of the evening. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? That makes sense. Follow me? Where the, where the, okay. This is the much more, another one of these much more passages. And uh, so, okay. He knew the grafting in the wild and the cultivated is not the norm, by the way. He's using it very actually idiomatically. But the critical issue for you and I, the destiny of Israel is declared by God himself, is strangely a controversy that divides the denominational churches from the biblical view. It's a huge wedge. You yourself need to study carefully to resolve this in your own mind. It's critical if you are going to understand the times in which we live. The verse that's going to be the pivotal verse in the whole study, not just the, the evenings, but in the whole series of 24 uh, of weeks, where Paul, his next verse, he says, if, but For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What's a mystery? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until 
the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That word until is the pivot point that we're all going to need to really understand. So, and the Gentiles should come in. Come in where? What's going on here? And this is all going to be unraveled in our next session. We're going to talk about Israel's future part two. This, is, this, is, this was part one of three, part two. We're going to take on in the next hour a survey, a review of the kingdom mysteries. And it's going to be full of real surprises to, to, even to the sophisticated biblical student. And so that's next time. And in preparation that you want to review the covenants, particularly the Davidic covenant. And with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.